So um, I'm not real big on poetry, but I'm going to start off with a short poem that I found that I thought uh, worked really well with uh, the, the lesson that I prepared for today. Um, it's called Comparisons. It's by G.K. Chesterton. If I set the sun beside the moon, and if I set the land beside the sea, and if I set the set town beside the country, and if I set the man beside the woman, I would suppose some fool would talk about one being better than the other. Men and women are different. Boys and girls are different. Uh, women, if they were to be like men, and men being like women, would make the world very boring, right? Um, God made us this way. He, he, he made us different for unique purposes. It's not just arbitrary differences. Um, pretending that that's just physical um, cheapens what God has done in his creation. If we're to raise our children to fulfill their purpose, we need to understand these differences and parent towards them. We should not on one, an, on one hand acknowledge these differences and then on the other pretend like they don't exist when we're choosing how we're going to raise our children. Uh, we need to aim where we're going to fire our arrows into the world. So as we're looking at this, let's start at the beginning. Genesis 1, 26 through 31. And I think I happened to copy out a uh, New King James, so uh, if it doesn't quite line up, uh, forgive me. Um, then God said, let us make man in our image, according to our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish in the sea, over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, uh, over all the earth and every creeping thing that creeps on earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. And then God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth and subdue it. Have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over every living creature that moves on earth. And God said, uh, See, I have given you every herb that yields seed, which is on the face of the earth, and every tree whose fruit yields seed to you shall be for food. Also to every beast of the earth, to every bird of the air, to everything that creeps on the earth in which there is life, I have given every green herb for food. And it was so. And then God saw everything that he had made, and indeed it was very good. So the evening and the morning were the sixth day. And then we see in Genesis 2, 18, and the Lord said, it is not good that man should be alone. I will make him a helper comparable to him. So now we, we see that God created, right? And there are some differences um, with, uh, in that. So as we're looking at that, what should we be looking at when we're raising our, our boys and girls? Um, first, we're gonna take a look at boys and then we'll move on to girls. Um, Boys need to be raised to be godly masculine men, or they will fall into effeminacy or machoism. Both of them are ditches on the sides of the road, and both are wrong. Um, we need to train our boys for leadership. They will lead something, whether that be the, the nation, the community, the church, in their careers, but at least in their family. Um, one helpful breakdown that I found of um, godly masculinity had um, five components of masculinity. Um, lords. We're created to exercise dominion. Um, this is where we get the, the cultural mandate to uh, conquer and subdue the earth, to, um, to, to really bring that under our domain, dominion. Uh, this we see in our, our boys um, when they go out to play, um, they're constantly building the tree fort in the backyard, right? Or, or uh, uh, making some kind of uh, fort off to the side uh, for their wars. Um, husbandmen, we're to make the world flourish. Um, we're supposed to settle down, 
tend and protect what we've been given to, uh, dominion over. Um, God put Adam in a garden, right? He didn't just throw him in the wilderness. Um, saviors. Um, obviously, this is modeled in, in Christ, our ultimate Savior, but also the, the other uh, masculine men in the Bible we have uh, that are heroes. Um, they defend and represent, they need something to defend and represent in battle. Um, uh, and then they must learn to sacrifice for their followers, right? Um, these, the, uh, we get all the stories of dragon slayers and, uh, and giant killers in, that we see throughout the Bible. Sages. Um, as, as a man grows in his masculinity, he should be a sage. Um, we see in Proverbs, um, starts out with, uh, in Proverbs 1 through 9, uh, of uh, wisdom being a woman training the boy. And then as we move through, um, as he progresses in wisdom, uh, it becomes a patroness, so a slightly different relationship as it grows and matures in masculinity. This is where intellectual study and, uh, and sitting down and proper learning is an important part of, of being masculine. It's not all about going out and chopping wood and, uh, and hunting things and being a warrior. And ultimately, glory bearers. Men are to be the glory of God. Um, as I was kind of touching on there in the the section about sages, the distinction between masculine and feminine within boys is, is not simply indoor or outdoor likes, right? Like some, some men and boys are, are, are drawn, drawn more towards academic pursuits or, or indoor activities. Um, that isn't necessarily feminine, right? Like um, ver versus outdoor. I think we see this um, particularly with uh, Jacob and Esau in the Bible, right? A, a lot of people try to portray um, Jacob as, as almost feminine. Um, but if we really look at his life, that, that wasn't the case. He was just more drawn towards the tent where uh, Esau was just more of a man of the field. Um, there are differences, but both masculine. Um, I know it's common, um, especially now, to dismiss stereotypes as harmful or wrong. Um, but stereotypes have generational wisdom. Like, there's a reason why they exist for the most part. Um, and as long as they're treated as generalizations, and we know that there will be exceptions and, and, and all the nuancing that we have to do to that, um, stere uh, gener uh, stereotypes can be helpful to us, right? Um, and I want to talk about a couple um, around boys um, that I think can help us in, in, uh, in identifying some of these tendencies and... Uh, um, working with them. Um, boys tend towards laziness. Um, so it's important that we need to instill a work ethic in them. Um, hard physical work um, is needed. Um, it, it brings males closer to Christ. Um, this is part of the curse, but it was also a blessing, right? The, the, the earth being cursed with thorns um, and having to work hard for our meals, um, it, I think was a model to make us, uh, or was, was put there to make us know that, that we weren't fully self-sufficient, right? I think we, we see this in um, how much easier it is for someone who is not rich to see their need for Christ instead of depending on their own. So in that way, that curse of this hard work is a blessing because we know that we get to the end of what we're able to do. Um, um, uh, next on that is laziness does not rest. Like, um, it's, rest is preparing for more work. Um, we see this with the, uh, with the Sabbath. Laziness robs us of the blessing of the Sabbath. The idea was that we work for six days and then we have the day of rest to, to recover and to prepare for more work. If you're not working, if, if those six days aren't labor, then there is no blessing in the day of rest. Um, within laziness is, is excuses, right? 
um, often. Laziness, even if it's willing to, even when it manifests as someone willing to do work, um, it'll avoid preparation. There's work that often needs to be done before the work's to be done. And that can easily run into, um, I think of uh, some of our younger kids when they're doing schoolwork. Oh, I can't work on my math problems. I need to go sharpen pencils. I need to get my papers together. I need to, all these things that could be done ahead of time to prepare for the labor that they have in front of them. Um, and ultimately, laziness is, is a lie, right? Laziness is dishonesty in labor, and often the first deception here is self-deception. So we need to make sure we guard against this in our boys. We need to build toughness in our boys. Um, when uh, a, a good way of doing this is um, when our boys are playing games uh, or roughhousing with each other, um, if something doesn't go their way, um, they don't win, the game doesn't go quite how they would want, or they get mildly hurt, right? They're, they're wrestling with their brother and they get a little bit hurt. Instead of coddling them and trying to make sure they feel okay, it, this is provided it's a mild injury, right? Like no broken arms. So there's, there's a time for, for coddling and comfort. But calmly saying to them, smile and continue on. Keep playing. There's no need to stop. Um, boys need to be knocked down first by people who love them. Um, if they're doing anything worth anything in their life, they're going to be knocked down. And if, they're not do and if it's not done for them in a loving, caring way first, um, this can be seen in, in uh, dads wrestling with their sons or older brothers or, or those things. Those are safe places for them to learn to be knocked down and how to deal with it before the world knocks them down, either physically or emotionally. Um, and this builds both physical and mental toughness. Um, there, and those two things are tied together. It's hard to have mental toughness without physical toughness. Um, we see this uh, with, our, uh, with our special forces. We, Navy SEALs go through BUDS training. Um, if you've looked into that much, it, it's grueling, almost torturous training that they go through. And it's not because that actually builds them into a better warrior. It's they're selecting for toughness. They're selecting for that mental fortitude that doesn't quit when their body's at the end. They, they want that character more than they want. Uh, they're not learning how to run or carry boats or any of that stuff in that training. Next, boys need to learn and be shown respect. A boy needs to respect and honor, especially their mothers. Men and boys deal in respect naturally, but when it comes to uh, the women in our lives, we somewhat need to be taught how to con communicate that. Um, and also a, a pitfall there is a son can, be, uh, can learn to manipulate their mother if we're not careful. Um, they, can, they can be coddled, they can have closeness without repentance. Um, I, the, the idea of, well, he's still acting out, but we had a really good talk. We, we, we really connected emotionally, and I, and I think we're in a better place now uh, without bringing the behavior in line. That's not saying that you shouldn't have that emotional connectedness, but we need to make sure that that respect is brought there and they're brought into line um, and showing proper respect uh, along with that emotional closeness. Um, some things for, for mothers, particularly, to watch out for their, with, with their sons. Um, you should regularly talk um, with the father about their sons. Um, you should talk to, your father, uh, to the father of your children about um, all of your children, um, but especially sons, um, because 
um, as a woman, you don't naturally understand the way men communicate and deal with things, right? Like it, it's, it, it's a learning process. And the father is already built into that model and knows how men relate. Um, again, she must have the respect and obedience of their sons and the fathers need to enforce this, especially as the boys get older, um, it becomes more difficult for that to be enforced by the mother if it's not already there. So then the father must step in and, and make sure that's done. Um, and she must never subsidize laziness uh, in her boys. Um, boys can work harder than they say. There's usually, I'd say almost always, a little bit more that they could do than, that, than they're willing to say they can. Um, next, boys should be given a trade or a vocation. Um, vocation comes from the Latin voco. Um, I don't know if my pronunciation of the Latin is right there. Uh, I'm, I'm not very good with languages, so we'll move on from that. Um, but the idea there is um, to be called upon, to call or to summon. So this is the, the calling is, is where we get the idea of, a, of vocation, not just a job. Um, we are to be stewards of this world, and men express this largely through our work. Um, it is what we spend most of our waking hours doing. And in Psalm 8, um, we see, Lord, O Lord, O Lord, how excellent is your name in all the earth, who have set your glory above the heavens. Out of the mouth of babes and nursing infants, uh, you ordain strength because of your enemies, uh, that you may silence the enemy and the avenger. When we consider your heavens, the works of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have ordained, what is man that you be mindful of him, and the son of man that you visit him? For you have made him little lower than the angels, and you have crowned him with glory and honor. You have made him to have dominion over the works of your hands. You have put all things under his feet. All sheep and oxen, even the beasts of the fields, the birds of the air, and the fish of the sea that pass through the, uh, the paths of the seas. O Lord, our Lord, how excellent, excellent is your name in all of the earth. We see there that we are to have dominion, and that implies the work that goes with that. Um, and then in the New Testament, if we look at Ephesians 2, 8 through 10. For by grace you have been saved through faith and not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for all good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Um, I wanted to look in that passage, particularly about uh, our highlight there, that we're his workmanship, created for Christ Jesus in all good works. Um, this is, um, I think we have a tendency to, in, in modern society, to have a strong separation between the, uh, the secular and the sacred. Um, historically, all things are God's, and that did not exist. There was one world that included the spiritual and the physical. And so when we're looking at our good works, this isn't just spiritual good works uh, of uh, preparing a Bible lesson or, or sharing the gospel. While those things are definitely included, it would also include the good works you do with honest, hard work through your day and how that can serve the Lord. Um, I think we get into a, a bit of a, a soft Gnosticism um, with our strong separation between the, uh, the secular and sacred. Um, and that makes our, our everyday life seem less important um, than, than the spiritual things. What we do on a, on, a, on a Thursday afternoon is just as important in a slightly different light than what we do on Sunday morning. Men are to have a mission and women are to come alongside that as help meets. If we don't prepare to our boys to have a mission in their life and to work something out, it'll be much harder for a godly woman to come alongside them 
and be their help me. It's really hard for a woman to come alongside a man and fulfill her proper role if he's not fulfilling his. So we need to prepare our boys to be the kind of men that their families will need them to be. Um, this idea of, of preparing our sons for a vocation um, includes, but is in no means limited to, education. We need to know our sons well enough by working alongside them and encouraging them uh, to uh, encouraging them and helping them um, by providing the training that they need for for what we see as their calling. Um, I personally would recommend um, in our current environment. We can talk about this separately, uh, but I'd, I'd recommend something where they can either be um, uh, they can be either employed um, by a company or self-employed um, as someone who, who, ha who has a white collar office job. Um, we can talk about some of the constraints that come along with that um, if you want to have a side conversation at some point as to why I would recommend not going that route. Um, some of this across the board is, is it's, this is difficult in our modern society, right? Um, Pre-industrial revolution, the household was the center of economic activity. Um, as a result of the industrial revolution, men have been pulled out of the home to work in factories and offices. Uh, and later in that process, women also. Um, this has led to the compartmentalizing of our lives. Work is no longer something that we do with our family and at home. Um, much of household work has now been outsourced. Um, it takes much less to handle tasks of keeping the home than it used to. And even uh, children are often sent off for education uh, for a longer period of time than they previously would have. Um, with trying to, to regain some of that, um, we need to, to try to um, rebuild this proper view of home and household, um, which again is difficult um, in modern society where, where work and all these things that take up so much of our time pull us away. So we need to be very intentional um, of trying to build that closeness that's built in. Um, now moving on to our daughters. Our, deed, our daughters need to have feminine beauty modeled for them. This is tricky, as the assault on the feminine was indirect at first, um, starting by tearing down the masculine. Now we see where this was going. Uh, it's worked its way out in our society. Um, I think of uh, movies that have strong female characters that are no longer feminine. Um, uh, in mind, because of things I've recently been watching, I was thinking of uh, the character of Galadriel in uh, Lord of the Rings. Um, she was a powerful, regal queen of the elves, and very feminine. In the new Amazon Rings of Power TV show, um, she's now a brash warrior and is much more masculine than most of the male characters. Um, we need to teach our girls the high calling of wife and mother because the world is telling them that this is a waste of time and talents. If uh, Think about going back to a high school reunion and you're gathered around everyone that you've been with and you're, well, what do you do? What do you do? Well, I'm a wife and mother. It's almost thought of as, as, uh, as oh, that's all. And that should not be the case. I found a quote from Gordon B. Hinckley um, saying, women who make a house a home are a far greater contribution to society than those who command large armies or stand at the head of impressive corporations. As we look at women and, and, our, and the roles that they were created for, um, and with this, we see that the part of 
what women were made for was filling the earth, right? The, cre the, um, the dominion mandate in the garden, right? Where man was supposed to uh, take dominion and fill the earth. A man can't do that by himself, right? Um, and I think this is a case of, in modern society, we, can, uh, we confuse capable of doing something with created for doing something. Women's bodies were created for having babies and carrying them. It, it's not something they have to learn or do or, or put in uh, direct effort to do. This is what they were created to do. Um, and I think we see that um, and the pushback against it in how um, birth control and abortion are the center of the feminist agenda. Um, a woman is to be a helper. Um, we see that, that um, man was not created, or, or um, well, man was not created for woman, but woman for man. And, and ultimately for glorifying. If we look at, at 1 Corinthians 11. Now I praise you, brethren, that you remember me in all things and keep the traditions just as I have delivered them to you. But I want you to know that the head of every man is Christ and the head of woman is man and the head of Christ is God. Every man praying or prophesying, having his head covered, dishonors his head. But every woman who prays or prophesies with her head covered dishonors her head, for that is one and the same as if her head were shaved. For if a woman is not covered, let her also be shorn. But it is shameful for a woman to be shorn or shaven, let her be covered. For a man indeed ought not cover his head, since he is the image and glory of God, but woman is the glory of man. For man is not from woman, but woman for man. Nor was man created for the woman, but the woman for the man. For this reason, the woman um, ought to have a symbol of authority on her head because of the angels. Nevertheless, neither is man independent of woman, nor woman independent of man in the Lord. For as woman came from man, even so her man also comes through woman. But all things are from God. Some people might take that passage of the woman being the glory of man and man being the glory of God to say that the woman is lower than man, and, and that's not right and doesn't line up with kind of the expression. Um, so as we look at this, um, woman is, if, if uh, man is God's glory and woman is man's glory, that, that's, that's a higher glory, right? Like, we, we see this um, chaining of things not being derivative and of a lower status, but a, of being um, kind of a, a concentrated and, more, and higher status. Um, I think of like the holy of holies, right? That, that wasn't derivative and a lesser holy, it was more so. Um, so the glory, of, the glory of man is more refined um, in the woman. Um, So how does, that, how does this work out, right? So, so we see this idea. What kind of things should we be pointing our daughters to in order to fill, fill their design purpose? Um, it's a good thing. The Bible's not silent on this. Um, in Titus 2, 3 through 5, uh, we see older, men, or older women likewise to be reverent, or reverent in behavior, not slanderers or slaves, uh, uh, too much wine. They are to teach what is good, and so train the young women to love their husbands and children, to be self-controlled, pure, working at home, kind and submissive to their own husbands, that the word of God may not be reviled. We see in there that, that there's this charge to be makers in the home. If God put half of the human race in charge of managing and making the home, I think it's probably a pretty important task. Um, when we're unpacking that a bit, um, what is managing a home, right? Um, certainly it's cooking and cleaning. 
Um, it, it's more than that, though, but certainly not less than that. Um, I think the idea here is the um, focus towards the home um, as more of a more than more so than a, um, than a checklist of what women should be doing. It's not a um, um, hey, check off these things and you've managed your home. It's this idea of, of what you do should be looking towards your home and building into it. Um, and I think we see that in, in the way in Titus they, they talk about the, the, the different, how it looks different at different seasons in life um, as to what a woman would be doing. Um, I think we also see this in the Proverbs 31 woman. While what she's doing isn't all in the home, right? She's going out into the marketplace, she's buying a field, she's doing all these things, but the focus of what she is doing is her home. She's doing that to bring this stuff back and, and to be honored by uh, her children. Um, and this, this idea, um, when we take it as, as being more of a focus as opposed to a, a checklist of, of, of what to do at the, in the home um, can also apply to all women, not just married women, right? Um, because if you were a, a, a younger single woman, the idea of managing the home with a checklist of cooking and cleaning would take a few minutes of your day, then what are you to do, right? But if your focus is on, on building up the home, which could include a, a larger group of people than maybe your immediate family in, in that season in your life, um, you'd be building into um, the, the people in your life and, and building that up. Um, and that's a way that God has made women especially equipped. Um, the home is where people are shaped and built into what they will be. Um, that's why this is such a high calling and deserves so much honor. Um, as fathers, um, we need to admire our daughters and our and we need to admire our wives in front of our daughters so that they see how highly we regard them and how important what they do is. And mothers, you need to uh, view the work you do around the house um, as important. It's not just a utility of, well, the dishes need washed and we need to have dinner on the table, right? The, these are important things that God has called us to uh, and we should be able to glorify God in that and model that for our daughters so that they see that and that is how they will know that these things are important so that when they grow, they will have proper attitudes towards them. So in conclusion, I think what I was trying to get at here was just intentionality. Um, I think we, we see the difference in men and women and we often talk about it in adult men and women but we don't often think about that um, when we're raising our children and what our goals are for the, our children and where they're directed um, and how they would live uh, the most God-honoring and glorifying life. I think um, one thing that, I'll, that I hear um, sometimes is this idea of searching for personal fulfillment in what we do. Um, and I don't see biblically where we're called to that. I think we're called to service and submission, and I think ultimately um, we find our fulfillment in that, um, not necessarily in the things we think will be awesome and fun to do and fulfilling. I think uh, if we look around the world, we'll see lots of people doing what they thought would be fulfilling, um, that are left empty and depressed. And um, so I think uh, having that attitude of selflessness and service, uh, both for our boys and our girls, um, but it looks different in, in both genders, uh, is important. Any words, Seth? I, I, I see it. Okay. Okay. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, 
thank you for this time you've given us together today. Lord, we pray, or I pray that you'll, uh, this will give um, the young parents and, and all of us something to think about, um, to chew over, to, to look to your word, um, to see what is, is good and true in what was said, and, and if there was anything that wasn't, to, to work that out. Um, Lord, we pray that, that this will just, that this lesson will have just been a blessing for, for those of us here. Praise in Jesus' name. Amen.